Edgar Casey inspired people to reimagine their world and their place within it. Artists, business professionals, doctors, homemakers, teachers, and more found their strengths through the Casey material. They wrote books, conducted experiments, and hit the road to try to validate the information in the readings and build an international community dedicated to physical, mental, and spiritual health. In this video series, we're introducing you to the men and women who kept the Casey work thriving. This week, meet Gladys Davis Turner. Gladys was born on January 30th, 1905, near Centerville, Alabama, to Annie Wallace Davis and Thomas Jefferson Davis. Her father, a tenant farmer, moved the family several times, finally settling in Selma. Her mother and father wanted her to become a school teacher. However, Gladys's interest was piqued when her father excitedly described the wonders of a typewriter he had seen in an office one afternoon. With her parents' approval, Gladys left Selma High School and enrolled in the Central City Business College. She graduated with a degree in shorthand and typing in 1920. The Casey family was also living in Selma at the time where Edgar ran a successful photography studio. A devout Christian, he taught Sunday school and led his church's youth activities. Gladys' sister Mary became friends with Hewlin Casey, Edgar's oldest son, when she joined Edgar's Junior Christian Endeavor Group. By 1923, Gladys worked as a secretary for Tissier's Hardware in the same building as the Casey Art Company. Gladys and Edgar politely acknowledged each other in passing as he climbed the stairs to his studio. It was only in August of that year when Edgar arranged a group audition to find a new stenographer that their lives would truly intertwine. Gladys went to the audition as a favor for a friend. She was surprised when Mr. Casey called her into the studio a few days later and offered her the job. Mr. Casey was very nice. He's, he, uh, just like he always was later, he sat down on the couch and talked to us a little bit, and then he, uh, and he, I felt very comfortable, you know, there. I didn't feel like there was anything strange about it. I mean, the whole, through, through the whole thing. Um, uh, Nell said to me one time down in Florida, you remember that? He, uh, we, people were asking me questions. Weren't you awed by this uh, uh, situation, you know, they have you, uh, this taking dictation from a man lying on the couch, you know, like that. And uh, I said, no, I, I didn't. And, and Nell said, why should she be? Doesn't every uh, Doesn't secretary take, a, take dictation from a man lying on the couch asleep? <laughs> Her official position may have been stenographer, but Gladys handled numerous responsibilities. She scheduled appointments for readings by mail and by telephone. She helped Gertrude Casey with household tasks and would look after the Casey's younger son, Edgar Evans, when his parents needed to travel. Edgar and Gertrude treated Gladys like an adopted daughter. She followed the Casey's when they traveled to Ohio, then to the Virginia coast, despite recurring financial insecurity and continued separation from her family and friends. Gladys was the hub of the wheel around which the success of Edgar's work turned. During the Second World War, she trained the steadily growing number of office staff needed to handle the hundreds of letters and phone calls that poured in after Thomas Sugru published Edgar's biography. The war years brought unprecedented strain as the clamor for readings grew stronger and Edgar and Gertrude's health became weaker, eventually leading to their deaths in early 1945. Gertrude named Gladys one of the administrators of the Casey estate. At war's end, Gladys was more determined than ever to ensure the survival of the readings, not just for preservation, but for future study. Back in 1940, the association had built a vault attached to the Casey home. Filing cabinets lined the walls, filled with thousands of case files. Researching those files to locate specific bits of information was almost impossible. Everyone relied on Gladys's excellent memory to find what they needed. The situation was unsustainable. When Helen Casey returned from Europe in 1945, he, his brother Edgar Evans, and Gladys, with the help of Tom Segrew, began making plans for preserving and indexing the readings. They established the Edgar Casey Foundation in 1948, and Gladys was appointed as secretary. Segrew launched a fundraising campaign 
based primarily in the New York City area, where there was a strong AOE following. Gladys wrote a pamphlet for the campaign called A Sequel to the Story of Edgar Cayce, in which she described how fragile the readings were, even then. The carbon impression was just barely legible in some cases. Gladys would frequently use a magnifying glass to decipher many of the readings. The paper was crisp with age and many of the copies were torn. The foundation originally planned to microfilm all of the readings and place copies in several major American cities for AOE members to access. The microfilming was completed, but the network of readings databanks never materialized. The foundation also raised funds to index the readings. Gladys started building the index in 1947, which she estimated to be a three-year project. An early foundation report took 24 years to complete. Gladys's colleagues marked her success in a big way. They celebrated November 27, 1971 as thankful for Gladys Day, with a banquet in her honor in the Ocean Scope Room of the Marshalls Hotel overlooking the sea. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye! A proclamation! Whereas this is the Thanksgiving season, and whereas Gladys Davis Turner, here in after known as our Gladys, has recently completed the monumental task of indexing the Edgar Casey readings, and whereas the book, Miss Gladys and Edgar Casey's Legacy, will soon be off the press, and whereas our Gladys has already started her book about Edgar Casey's correspondence, and whereas our Gladys will soon be traveling about the country, disseminating her very special brand of love and wisdom, we hereby declare and pronounce November 27, 1971, be thankful for Gladys Day. President of the Edgar Casey Foundation, Robert Adrians, and Hugh and Casey gave speeches commending Gladys's dedication to the work for so many years. What had started as a favor for a friend in 1923 had become the commitment of a lifetime. Gladys would continue to safeguard the readings until her death in 1986. On a December morning in 1949, a letter from Philadelphia arrived on Gladys's desk. Albert E. Turner wrote that he was a Sunday school teacher who was using the Edgar Cayce readings interpretation of the Book of Revelation in his classes. How in the world did he have the nerve? Gladys wrote in her memoir. Hal moved to Virginia Beach in 1950 to join the AARE community and continue a spiritual journey he had been traveling for several years. He became a beloved study group leader on the Bible and found a spiritual home with the local Quaker meeting house. He became close friends with Gladys over his many hours spent researching the readings. Their friendship deepened, became something more. Al and Gladys were married on July 20th, 1952, a ceremony held in Lydia Schrader Gray's apartment, an AOE speaker and close friend of Gladys and the Casey's. Lydia had helped Gladys nurse Gertrude Casey in her final months. Al and Gladys moved into Gladneesh, the home she had built next door to the Casey's. Al retired from business and turned to gardening, lovingly tending the flowers around their home and the AOE grounds. Al devoted himself to Gladys for the 16 years of their marriage. In the early 1960s, he suffered from a heart attack and other health problems. Gladys wrote in a letter to a relative that although Al felt quite weak, he would drive with her to the grocery store, wait patiently in the car while she did her shopping just to be near her. In the 1970s and 80s, Gladys's dear friends and fellow staff members at the ARE asked her if she would transform her incredible knowledge of the history of the Casey work into a form that would last for posterity. She put together over 50 volumes of cross-reference letters, legal documents, and other records in chronological order in preparation for writing her own book. Although she never finished the book, what she collected has been a repeated boon to me a relative Casey newcomer. I love how meticulous she was in every detail. Her notes in the margins of literally thousands of pieces of paper have felt me out more times than I can say. Her presence as I work in the archives is a comforting constant. I love that on a February afternoon in 1975, Gladys told her staff she was going out to run errands, but instead met Leslie Wilmore, a friend of Al and a member of the, his Bible study group, at the courthouse for their marriage ceremony. 
Unbeknownst to the couple, Yulin had arranged a surprise wedding reception at ARE when Gladys and Les returned for their evening study group meeting. I admire how resilient Gladys was when she lost both Les and Yulin in 1982, only a month apart. I love how brave she was, how self-driven. I respect the faith it took to veer from the usual course of a young woman in her time and place, to drop out of high school, learn the skills to earn a living for herself, and to choose to work for a man who could not offer material stability, but perhaps more importantly, connected her to the beauty and mystery of the universe and our place within it. <laughs>